All right. Welcome, everybody. Um, hi, my name is Kate Tallman. I'm the chair of the Help I'm an Accidental Government Information Librarian webinar series. I'm from the University of Colorado Boulder. Um, this series is brought to you by the American Library Association's Government Documents Roundtable, or GoDort, and thanks for coming. Um, you will all be muted during this webinar, but we encourage you to participate in the chat. If you don't see a chat window, you can always click on the chat icon at the bottom of your screen. If there are any technical issues that you run into, you can reach out to Kelly Wilson, who's our Zoom tech. Um, and you can feel free to chat with her and get advice on what's going on. Um, worst case scenario, please remember that this um, session is being recorded. All right, so um, real quick, some housekeeping. Our next webinar is October 18th. This is on reporting on the world of government information. It's a panel presentation from the editors of IFLA's professional report, Government Information Landscape and Libraries. Uh, if you have any topic ideas, uh, please let me know. Uh, my email is, uh, I'll put it in the chat once I'm done talking. It's katherine.w.talman at colorado.edu. And if you're a member of an ALA GoDort committee and would like to co-host an event like this one, please also reach out. And there will be a short survey at the end of this where you can share your thoughts on today's webinar and offer any future ideas for improvement or topics. You can also see all of our webinars on our YouTube channel. I will also post that link momentarily. So please subscribe. So as these uh, get done um, and uploaded, you will get to see them again. So um, today's webinar, I'm really excited about. It is uh, Secrecy 101, Classification and Executive Order one, well, 13526. It's co sponsored by our colleagues in GoDort's Education Committee. So I'm going to hand it off to them. Um, in particular, I'm going to hand it off to Aaron Wilson. Uh, for those of you who don't know Aaron, he's the Government Documents Coordinator at the University of Maryland Libraries. And I will pass it along to you, Aaron. Thank you very much. Thank you, Kate, for that introduction. And um, thank you also to the um, Help Webinar our series committee for um, their assistance in sponsoring this event, as well as to the members of the Goldor Education Committee for their continued support of making these events possible. Um, we are pleased to have with us John Powers, who will be our presenter today. John Powers is a 30-year public servant who, has, who just recently joined the Office of the Historian and the Department of State to lead the Office of Historians, the Classification Coordination, Publication, and Digital Initiatives Program. Before joining OH, he served as the Associate Director for Classification Management in the Information Security Oversight Office at the National Archives and Records Administration, NARA. He led a team of analysts in advising government agencies on policies for classifying, declassifying, and safeguarding national security information. He managed work of the Interagency Security Classification Appeals Panel, the government's highest appellate body for resolving classification and declassification determinations, and served as the senior staff officer for the Public Interest Declassification Board, which is an independent board tasked with making recommendations to improve the security classification system. Under his leadership, the board will publish five reports to the president including the most recent, most recently a vision of the digital age, modernization of the U.S. national security classification and declassification system, and a report to Congress on the feasibility of declassifying records related to U.S. nuclear weapons testing and cleanup activities in the Marshall Islands. John previously served two tours as the Director of Access and Information Management on the National Security Council staff at the White House, from 2015 to 2018 and from 2022 to 2023. He, he led a team responsible for reviewing and declassifying White House and NSC records for public access, including records for the Department of State State's Foreign Relations of the United States series. He conceived of and led the U.S. declassification project of Argentina that involves 16 other, depart other departments and agencies. John also co-led an interagency process that resulted in the declassification of historical presidents' daily briefs from the Kennedy, Johnson, Nixon, and Ford administrations. This past year, John led or co-led the interagency 
process for modernizing executive orders on controlled unclassified information, classified national security information, and special access programs. John began his career at NARA in 1991 as an archivist aide at the Nixon Presidential Materials Project, eventually serving as acting director in 2007. He reviewed President Richard Nixon's secret tapes and his administration's NSC papers for public access. He spent two years at the Lyndon B. Johnson Presidential Library declassifying LBJ's secret recordings. John it has a Bachelor of Arts in International Relations from the College of William and Mary and a Master of Arts in American History from George Mason University. John, we're great to we're glad to have you as a part of this series. And at this time, the floor is yours. Okay. Let's see, can you guys all hear me? Everybody can hear me. Fabulous. Okay. Um, so thanks for the introduction. I appreciate that. And thanks for the opportunity to be here on this very esoteric topic. Um, I'm obviously a fan of the American Library Association and specifically the Government Documents Roundtable. I've spoken to you all before, although it's been a long time uh, previously on uh, what to do when you come across classified documents in your collections um, from my previous job at the Information Security Oversight Office. So uh, happy to be here and, and talking about this. Um, this is the second topic. Uh, we're doing this late. I'm going to share my screen now. Let's see if I can do it correctly. And we will start this presentation here. All right. So um, this is a very esoteric topic, and we're putting the uh, the cart before the horse here a little bit, because back earlier in June, you heard from my friend and colleague, uh, David Mengel, uh, on the declassification process. And I am going to start backwards here and and talk a little bit about, like, what in the heck happens? How do you actually decide to classify information in the first place? Um so let's have a hopefully a good conversation. And I always start these presentations off with a disclaimer, since I am still a current government employee, that the views uh, expressed here today do not necessarily reflect the views of the White House, the National Security Council, the National Archives, ISU, where I used to work, or my current uh, uh, position here at the Department of State. So I'll, I'll state that up front. So, uh, Kate mentioned that here we're here to talk about Executive Order 13526, Classified National Security Information. Well, what does that actually mean? Um, and this organization, probably more than any, understands the difference between a record in a document and information and data. Uh, and very specifically, uh, believe it or not here, records are not classified, documents are not classified, but it's information and data within those that can be classified. And I emphasize that word can be for a reason, and we'll talk a little bit about that. Um, the records, documents, or other media, they are actually marked with a classification marking that alerts the reader, the user, that information in there is sensitive. So that's kind of how that breaks out a little bit. Now, when it was first signed back in 2009, it was considered kind of a groundbreaking order. You know, it was the, and there were two others that were considered kind of groundbreaking. President Nixon's was the first to talk about declassification, allowing citizens to request the declassification of information. President Clinton, when he signed his, was the first to introduce this topic of automatic declassification after a set period of years. And President Obama's order really took that a, a a step further or several steps further um, and and we'll talk a little bit about some of those steps as part of my presentation um, all of the orders that relate to classified information going all the way back to president truman uh, are divided into different sections david talked about section three i am primarily going to talk about section one and section two uh, on the on my slides today so first of all, there's a weird thing. As I said, this was a very esoteric topic. And there, there are 
fewer fewer than a hundred of us in government that really focus on this topic. It's that kind of esoteric um, and really care about this. Um, but what I'll tell you is that there are two types of, uh, of classification. There's original classification, which is the initial decision that specific information in the interest of national security should be protected against unauthorized disclosure. And that's the initial decision. And then the derivative classification decision is uh, when we the information itself is already classified and somebody else is using it, that information and using it perhaps differently or as part of a different project. And they are going to derivatively then classify that information. And I'll go into a little bit about how that works and, and how it's done in a little bit. But you should know that there essentially there are two types of classifications. There's original and derivative, which means that there are two types of classific people that can classify. There are original classification authorities, and then there are derivative classification authorities. And the derivative classification authorities is pretty much everybody who has a security clearance in the government and uses it, while the original classification authority are those individuals authorized in writing by the president or the vice president. Um, or select individuals within several different agencies. It's a fairly small number. Um, what's interesting and a little bit different here is that original classification authorities have discretion. And we're gonna talk about that discretion in a little bit. Derivative classifiers do not have discretion. They are supposed to follow the instructions and the guidelines and the rules established by the original classification authority. So President Obama, when he signed EO 13526 in December of 2009, he also issued a separate memo designating certain top officials as original classification authorities, OCAs. And 16 agency heads were listed by the president in that memorandum. Uh, and those tend to be the agencies you'd think of. Those are the departments that focus on national security as their main mission, and they can classify up to top secret, or those agencies that have as some type of involvement on in our national security, um, they have authority up to the secret level. And there's six of those departments, total of 16 different departments. What, I'll, what you'll notice here, what I said here, or what you see on the screen, you have top secret, you have secret. There are no confidential original classification authorities. Um, the president also recognized that, well, he's nominating and he's enabling 16 agency heads to originally classify information, but they have day jobs. They have important jobs to run their agencies, lead policies. Uh, so the executive order did give these agency heads the authority to uh, to delegate their authority downward to other senior leaders in the agencies. Um, and as I talked about here, the, the difference here for declassifiers, derivative declassifiers is that's everybody else. Uh, and then, and as I said, we we derivative classifiers have to follow the rules that are set by the OCAs. So 16 agencies have this authority. They're not many, believe it or not. This is the, a, the lowest number ever, if you can believe that. There are a total of 1,638 original classification authorities across government in the executive branch, across these 16 agencies. Um, most are at the secret level and they are most of those uh, come from my agency, the Department of State, where every ambassador has original classification authority. Um, and then the very small number at the bottom, there actually are three confidential OCAs in the Department of Defense um, who are allowed to classify up to the confidential level. Um, but that's it. Um, my former boss at the director of ISU and the Environmental Protection Agency Administration uh, Administrator both have original classification authority, but 
unlike the other national security agencies, they are not allowed to delegate it. It's theirs to use, and that's it. Now, I, I talked a little bit earlier about kind of the, 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 the groundbreaking nature of President Obama's order back in 2009. And that really has to get into, and he really did try to focus on efforts to limit overclassification and efforts to limit the delay of declassification of information. And so within this section one, which focuses on original classification, he set out a lot of different concepts and rules that even the original classification authorities must follow when making decisions on whether to classify or not to classify information. The most important one of those is that he put in words and language in the order that said, hey, if you have significant doubt about whether you need to classify this, you shouldn't classify it or classify it at a lower level. He also wanted to make sure that the information that derivative classifiers were receiving and derivative classifiers usually get their their guidance in the form of a of a classification guide. Um, and he required that these guides be reviewed every five years, that they be reevaluated for, for every bit of it to determine whether the information in there still needs to be classified and still needs to be classified at that level and still needs to be classified for that length of time. And he required specifically that that this be a whole of agency approach and a whole of agency effort as part of these five-year reviews that they involve original classifiers, derivative classifiers, subject matter experts who use the guides, uh, declassifiers, and surely there may have even been some Freedom of Information Act requests that have had uh, some effect on this. So he wanted to have uh, some input from the staff who do those, that do that type of work. And he also wanted historians to weigh in. Um, information is a rapidly changing area where information can become stale fairly quickly. So this five-year requirement was fairly new. And this was put in there after, uh, during the interagency process, my former agency at the Information Security Oversight Office learned that many of the agencies were using classification guides that were sometimes 30 or 40 years old, and the information was long obsolete, but they had never been changed. So this is one effort to really hold agencies accountable and to maintain current guidance for all of us who classify information derivatively. Uh, the second thing is that he did put some limits for original classifiers, that he put some time limits. They can classify up to 25 years, and that's it. Um, he made sure that uh, information would not be classified forever, indefinitely, and he put some very tight limits on what information could be reclassified. And these are really designed and important here uh, to ensure that information that's once been, it's made available to the public before it is taken off of a public shelf, there is a serious effort made to ensure that the information really truly is sensitive uh, and to make that effort. And I also like uh, would like to kind of say here that, you know, the, and, the, and I will tell you that this presentation kind of builds off of training that I give every year to original classification authorities because they are required to take uh, training every year on the use of their authority and specifically uh, to include uh, information about avoiding overclassification. And uh, the government typically has always had a response that, well, we're fairly risk averse and we're going to classify things just to be safe. And so to original classification authorities, I always stress that overclassification harms our national security too. It is not just an issue of transparency in trying to enhance our democratic tradition and democratic uh, access to information for citizens and participation in government, but overclassification, especially today and tomorrow and into the future, overclassification harms our national security 
because it limits or prevents information sharing, it harms decision making, uh, and it makes us less safe if people do not have the information that they need to act on it quickly. Um, so uh, to kind of continue along those kinds of line, within that first section that OCAs have to follow, there are many different um, efforts and many and much different, there are lots of language in here specifically on the importance of trying to avoid overclassification, including significant doubt, um, that the number of original classification authority delegations must be very limited, and it's a use or lose. If you don't use it, you lose it, and agency heads are expected uh, to police this work to ensure that their people that they have delegated their authority to are using it and using it appropriately by taking the training every year and reviewing the classification guides that they oversee every five years. Um, uh, and that, that fundamental classification guidance review that takes place every five years is very, very important for, for those reasons. So, what is the, there's four different criteria that original classification authorities have to use when making this decision uh, to classify information or not. And the first thing I want to say is I've copied some language here right out of the order, but I, I've, I want to emphasize that word may, and that is information may be originally classified because the original classification authority has that discretion. And within that discretion, no matter what, if, if she or he decides that the information should be classified, there's four basic criteria that the information has to fall within. And that is specifically the OCA has to make the decision. The information has to be owned by or produced by or is for the United States government. It has to fall within one of the categories of information that's eligible to be classified. And I'll show you that in a minute. Um, and then he has to be, he or she has to be able to her information is uh, leaked or let to the public or is subject to an unauthorized disclosure. You have to be able to describe the damage that occurs. So I think David talked about this back in June, that there are three levels of classification under President Truman's order. There were four. Uh, and so for those original classification authorities, when they decide to classify something as top secret, they have to be able to describe in detail the exceptionally grave damage that would occur if there is an unauthorized disclosure. Same is true with secret. They have to be able to describe the grave damage to national security and for confidential, the damage to national security. So there are eight general categories and going back to the, to the slide from, uh, from two ago, um, the information has to fit within one of these eight general areas. And these all kind of make sense, um, you know, military weapons and systems, um, not all foreign government information. Now this order does describe and define foreign government information as information given to our government with the expectation that we are going to keep it in confidence. Uh, and, uh, and that includes not just the information, but sometimes also the source. Uh, so the, the country or the international organization. So it's a little bit further defined later in the executive order, but as a rule, foreign government information can be classified. Certainly it makes sense to include intelligence activities same is true with foreign uh, relations. Um, of course, when we talk about scientific, technological, or economic matters relating to the national security, for as far as the technologies, those can be hardware, think stealth bomber, uh, for, for a period of time, or it can be software. Um, so it doesn't just have to be, uh, it can be a physical thing too. Um, makes perfect sense that we want to protect our, our nuclear facilities and uh, we want to protect our systems uh, and, and things like that, too. Okay. Now, I, I talked earlier and said that pretty much original classifications have the ability to classify information for up to 25 years. 
And after 25 years, their authority ends. They do not have the ability to continue classification beyond that period with two small exceptions. And those are for the names of a human intelligence source or the key design concept of a weapon of mass destruction. And those are exempted from declassification for 50 years. Now, uh, what I'll say is that not all information is automatically declassified at 25 years. And David spoke, I think, about this a little bit back in June. And that is that agencies do have the ability to exempt specific information from automatic declassification at 25 years. But that requires the approval of this interagency body called the Interagency Security Classification Appeals Panel. This is very important because now the decision on whether you can continue the classification beyond 25 years is not up to the agency head or to that delegated agency official. It is up to an interagency group of officials, high level officials from the Department of State, the Office of the Director of National Intelligence, the Office of Secretary of Defense, the Department of Justice, and the National Archives and the National Security Council. Combined, this group are the ones that make those decisions on if an agency is allowed and permitted to continue classification beyond 25 years. So of course, uh, importantly, there are things that no matter what, um, an original classification authority is not allowed to classify. Um, and that is you cannot classify information for reasons other than national security. That is national security is the only reason that you may classify information. You cannot use the classification system to conceal a violation of law, to prevent embarrassment, to restrain competition, or delay the release of information that otherwise should be released. And there are within the executive order sanctions for officials that do that, including losing your clearance, losing your original classification authority. So there are uh, sanctions av available if that happens. Now I'm gonna move on and talk a little bit about the rest of us. Uh, so not those 1,638 people, but the other people who do most of the classification work in the government. Um, and that's the derivative classifiers. Now we have to follow the rules. Um, our job is to do what the original classification authority told us to do. Um, we are expected to kind of follow those instructions. And there are many reasons to do that, right? Um, first of all is consistency. We are wanna make sure that everybody across an agency who is looking at the same information is classifying that information the same way for the same length of time and at the same level. Consistency is very important. Otherwise you put information at risk. Um, and it requires, once you've made that uh, decision that you're gonna, this information must be classified, that I'm gonna follow the original classification authority's decision, you are required on whatever record you are working to put down, uh, you have to put down your identity, you have to put down the the reason that you are classifying the information and why, that's the classification guide. Um, and you have to talk about uh, how it is that uh, when this information is automatically declassified, which can be no more than 25 years, with the exception, the small limited exceptions of those key design concepts of weapons of mass destruction or the names of confidential human intelligence sources. Um, typically, original classification authorities, when they make a decision, they make it in the form of a declassification, they make it in the form of a classification guide. See, I'm, I'm in the declassification world mostly. Um, but they make it in, in the form of a classification guide. Uh, and those have to also kind of follow these same rules. But the expectation is even if you were going to be classifying information when you create that guide for 25 years, after five years, you are required to reevaluate that information to see if it still meets the requirements for classification or not. The idea here, again, is that you're going to be deleting information that 
uh, does not need to be classified. But it really is very important for those of us that do the derivative classification that we follow these rules exactly. So we follow these rules and we're gonna be putting, uh, we put our instructions on here, we put our names on here, we portion mark records, but often derivative classifiers use many different sources. So if I'm an intelligence analyst at, a, at the Office of the Director of National Intelligence, I may be receiving information from several different agencies on a topic. And when I combine all of those and I'm writing an analytical piece on it, I may be using information from the National Security Agency, the Central Intelligence Agency, the, uh, ANTA, the uh, um, National Reconnaissance Office and the Department of State. And if I use information from all of those agencies, I have to cite every single classification guide that I used in writing the text uh, of that document or that record. And that's very important for accountability's sake, but it's also very important to help us identify if there is a request for that information to declassify it, or even to classify it at a lower level. Who do we need to go back to to, uh, to see if that information can be declassified or classified at a lower level? This is a way to help bring some of that accountability in and also make it easier to do that process. Now, the next couple of slides all come directly from training that I used to give to original classification authorities. Original classification authorities must sit through a presentation and do training every year. It has to focus on the danger and the worry of overclassification. And so this is one of these slides that I really do try to focus them on here uh, and to really let them know that they are expected to be keeping their decisions to a minimum. They are expected to keep information secret only as long as necessary. And they're expected to only classify information for a legitimate reason to protect our national security. Um, and I talked a little bit earlier about like the importance of transparency in our government. And it really is, and it's an underlying principle of our government to have citizen access to the information they need to hold our government officials accountable uh, and to learn our history. And at the same time, that compact also says on behalf of our citizens, our public servants and our highest level public servants are only going to keep information from the public that protects our national security. And of course, for the for the OCAs that I give this training to, I also really stress the importance of why you want to reduce and really think hard about whether you need to classify information or classify it at a lower level is because we really do in today's digital age need to rapidly share information with people who need to see it to make good informed decisions. And I'll talk about that on this next slide here. So the, we are no longer in an era of paper and uh, in vaults and uh, which are called SCIF, Secure Compartmented Information Facilities. We have warfighters on battlefields, diplomats on foreign posts. Uh, we need to rapidly move information to people who need to see it quickly. Um, so the ability to share information vertically and horizontally with these people means we need to classify information properly or at a lower level or at not at all to ensure that we can get the information to where it needs to go so that we can maintain our decision advantage. Um, Overclassification diminishes informed decision making. People will make bad decisions if they don't have the full picture. It's simple as that. Um, there's been a lot in the news lately, the last year and a half or so, especially from my uh, former colleagues at the Public Interest Declassification Board, who talk about the effect of classification hindering innovation and reducing competition and the increasing the, in the, the, the really challenge of the lengthy acquisition times, which adds to the cost to us, the taxpayers, and it also reduces the decision advantage we have on a technology, if it's taking us 10 years to get uh, uh, a, a technology uh, from concept to 
active on, on our national secure toolbox, um, that's time lost. So the less classification and proper classification really does help that. Um, the other thing, of course, is like the American taxpayer, it costs a lot of money to keep things secret. Uh, back in 2017, which was the last year that my old office, the Information Security Oversight Office, kind of uh, publicly kind of reported on its costs, the costs were $18.5 billion. That's a lot of money. Um, that's a lot of money. Uh, and then the final thing I'll say here, too, and that is if everything is classified, nothing is classified. And um, it, you really do risk uh, reducing the respect of the classification system if you are classifying something top secret that should only be classified secret or shouldn't be classified at all. You put that information at risk overall when people don't respect the classification system. Um, this is my third slide that I show to original classification authorities. Um, but what I want to uh, what I wanted to show here on this are two things. Um, and I and I did this for when I worked on the, the National Security Council staff too here. Um, but let me let me draw your attention to two figures here as a as a librarians and as a government documents archivists and librarians here that we spent back in 2017 18 and a half billion dollars on keeping things secret. We only spent a hundred million dollars on declassifying information. And that's not a lot of money. And that discrepancy is going to get is going to affect our democracy. Uh, the volume of information has greatly exceeded our ability to declassify it. Um, if you look here, and this is the other kind of uh, figure that I like to show here, and that is the volume of electronic records just held by my old agency, the Presidential Libraries, which went from Reagan and Bush combined to less than two terabytes of electronic data to Donald Trump's administration, who in four years amassed over 250 terabytes of data, as much as the previous president, Barack Obama, had amassed in eight. And more importantly, the George W. Bush Library has a backlog of 153 million pages in its FOIA queue. Freedom of Information Act Q. And under the current processing, it's going to take 130 years to declassify and make that records and make that information available to the public. And access denied uh, is not helpful to our democracy. It certainly is not helpful to our policymakers either, who will want to learn from the past. So we do need to think about uh, adjusting that bottom figure of 103 million and investing in technologies and processes that will enable us to do a much better job of declassifying information uh, when it no longer needs to be classified. Now, a, a lot of people have talked about the effect of Julian Assange and uh, Edward Snowden and other, other folks who, uh, who leaked information. And what I will say, is that all authorized holder, whether you're an original classification authority, whether you are a derivative classifier, whether you, and if you have a security clearance, even if you don't use your derivative classification abilities, if you have a security clearance, you are expected in the order, uh, President, Obama, President Obama's order expects you to challenge the classification uh, if you do not believe in good faith the information is properly classified. It's either improper in itself, or it's classified at too low or too high of a level, or it no longer meets the standards of the executive order that I showed you, and it should be de declassified. And it does include in this executive order processes for how one goes about making a classification challenge. And I stress this in my training too, that the first is that every agency is required to have formal written procedures on how to receive and how to evaluate a classification challenge. Um, and that includes an informal challenge that could be word of mouth or a formal challenge that's done in a written format. Um, original classification authorities have a role to play in deciding those challenges. But even if the original classification authority ultimately decides, no, I think that information is classified, the person who's made that challenge can still appeal. So there are appellate processes within the agency. 
And if that person is still not happy with the appellate level decision, he can go to the interagency security classification appeals panel and have this interagency body make that decision. This body does prioritize those classification challenge appeals so that they're decided upon fairly quickly. Um, I can tell you that I have done, uh, I have challenged classification personally um, and they've come out in my favor, but they were, uh, they were considered uh, very robustly within the agency and at the appellate level too. But the decision was made fairly quickly that no, that information is no longer classified. So this process does work, I can tell you that. Uh, and it is put in there specifically to permit those of us who believe that information is classified for the wrong reasons or at too high a level have the ability uh, within the system to help make that decision. And I'd also say kind of lastly here that there is no matter what, uh, the agencies are required in their written procedures to ensure that there is no retribution for anybody who makes a classification challenge. Um, this is kind of my concluding slide by quoting Potter Stewart from the Pentagon Papers case back in 1971. Uh, and this is very important here for when everything is classified, nothing is classified and the system becomes one to be disregarded by the cynical or the careless. The classification system for me personally, it is very important that we do classify information. There are important secrets that we need to keep to protect our nation's security. Um, but I also firmly believe that we should only classify what we must um, and that we have to be able to share that information with our allies, our partners, with all of the stakeholders who need to see that information, who can use that information to protect us. Uh, and to do so in a way that they can protect us in in a timely fashion. Um, I spent a lot of my career declassifying information, so the power to declassify is very important. Uh, it is a key democratic tenet, and uh, it's it's one that is a uh, uh, it, that is very important to our democracy. So I will leave it at that. I've I've droned on about the classification system for forty minutes, so thanks for bearing with me, and I'll throw it back to Aaron. So thanks very much. Thank, thank you so much, Don, for, for such a, a enlightening presentation. I, I, I know many of us really are grateful for just your, the opportunity of having you here and to speak speak so more in depth about this this topic. Um, and you see the applause coming from from members of the um, the, the attendees that have, have gathered with us. Um, I do want to open the floor to questions. I do see a few questions in the chat. Um, I do want to make sure that I am going through all of them, and I'll at least start with some of the ones initially um, that were saved in the chat. Um, Barbara, Barbara Lever, um, Levergood did pose a question, if only information and data, but not records or documents are classified, then in what form are the information and data reviewed? And I think you may have hit that one, John. Yeah, it's a great question, though, and it really is. It's true that information data, that's what is classified. It's the information itself. Um, the media is uh, is how information is marked, and it's supposed to be marked anyway as confidential, secret, or top secret, whether that's on paper, um, if it's electronic, uh, in an electronic format, even on the electronic front format at the very top, there's usually there are what I did not talk about in this presentation uh, in addition to Executive Order 13526, there is something called an implementing directive, which is 32 CFR 2001. And if you go to the Information Security Oversight Office and to their policy document section, you'll find both the executive order and this implementing directive. And the implementing directive essentially provides the instructions for how you uh, implement Executive Order 13526. And it has a very big section on how you properly mark infor, re, mark records, whether it's electronic data or different types of media to ensure that it is the user understands that the information they are about to read, use, look at um, is classified and is restricted and, and sensitive in some way. Thanks. Thank you. 
Um, another question in chat, and for those who may have questions, feel free to raise your hand within the attendees function, um, which you will find, I believe, under the reactions tab. Um, the next question is from Ben Amada, and the, it's a two-part question I see. How do we know if the intent or practice of the executive order is working to reduce overclassification? That's the first question. Um, does it appear so based on your status? And who provides the data on classifying and declassifying? Those are also great questions. Um, one of the things, well, what I did not talk about in this presentation, but it's included in, in a section of the executive order. Um, there is a section in the order that talks about program management, both within an agency and then overall across the executive branch. The information security oversight is tasked with every year compiling statistics from agencies to evaluate the health of the classification system and then to report on what it finds to the president. Um, the last one, if you go to, again, if you go to the Information Security Oversight's Office website, um, the last report to the president is from fiscal year 2022. Um, and it will talk about uh, the health of the classification system, what they found from gathering data from the agencies, the number of OCAs, the decisions that they have made. Um, we used to report on the number of derivative classification decisions that have made, um, but it looks not just at that, it looks at the number of classification challenges that the agency has received. It looks at how many classification guides agencies have and how many they have updated, uh, how many have they determined were obsolete, things like that. And then this is all then publicly reported both first to the president and then it's put up on the IC website. So that's one mechanism to both in, improve the system by ensuring that there's accountability and to being very transparent about it. Um, what I'll also say though, is that back in 2009, this executive order was pretty groundbreaking. It really was, uh, especially on this idea here of trying to, uh, to really focus on reducing the volume of overclassification and to putting strict limits on the ability of agencies to exempt information from automatic declassification. That said, this order was still very much written with paper in mind. We are no longer in an era of paper as one of the slides I just showed you. Um, and it's one of the reasons why uh, if, you, if you look at the FY 2022 ISOO annual report, you'll see that uh, the government is in the process of developing a new executive order that I think will be much more focused on the digital government that now exists and, and also in looking for new metrics to evaluate the success of what it comes up with in terms of holding people accountable and for classifying information at the correct level. Thanks for that. Thank you. Another question, Bar Barclay Walsh. Um, poses, is the George W. Bush Library the farthest behind in responding to, to FOIA requests of all the presidential libraries? You know, that's a tough question. So so first, of course, the, there are a couple other laws that kind of weigh in here, too. So the, the Presidential Records Act does limit uh, in, in it does kind of put in some rules about when you can start to receive FOIA requests uh, and also kind of sets limits on uh, on the restrictions that apply. I think the Bush Library at the moment has the longest, but I don't know that for a fact. Um, but I would suspect that since it's the one of the more recent libraries and has a great volume of data, um, that it's probably the largest. Uh, it, is a, it is a concern, I think, for the presidential libraries and all across government here, I think, um, uh, on how to look for new methods to automate processes as opposed to doing the manual review that that David talked about, that even though it used to take on a good day, seven years to get a single piece of paper through the entire process, um, that process, even if it's reformed, does not work with 250 terabytes worth of data. It just does not. You have to use machine learning technologies. Uh, the Partnership for Public Service recently uh, published an article about my agency's effort to start to think about using machine learning technologies to help automate some of those uh, decisions. So that process has started already. Um, Kate, I was gonna open up if you had a question that you would like to pose. 
Well, he just answered it. I was just going to ask about, um, you know, how machine learning tools or AI or um, it, how they might help in this process, but also how they could <clears throat> present a challenge um, and, and you know, protecting information from actually being released that shouldn't be. So, um, but that seems to have been addressed, but I imagine it's something that your agency's talking about quite a bit. Yeah, they are. And this is, it is a very difficult uh, issue here. Uh, and and uh, agencies are using lots of artificial intelligence and machine learning technologies for other things now. Um, I think it's important that we, this is John Powers talking here, but I think that we do, it is important that we try these uh, and we do some risk analysis and to see what we get right. Don't let the perfect be the enemy of the good, perhaps. But we have to recognize that, well, maybe there are some bits of information that we don't want released, that really we do need to be perfect. Maybe that's that highest level top secret information that's very current. Um, but there are some things that we need to at least think about and try and to look at it at a, 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 a more risk based approach, especially as information gets older. Um, that's another thing about the digital age here, that is that information becomes stale very, very quickly. Um, so there isn't really as big of a need to keep things rotely classified for longer periods of time, especially because events have just overtaken them uh, uh, quicker. So I, I do think that there is a role for AI and machine learning in this process. It's one that's going to be that is going to require some pretty good uh, thought and some technologists to work on it. It's going to require lots of good data and time. Um, but it is something that I think the government is going to have to address. Um, I know that Aaron is at the University of Maryland. The University of Maryland is a leader in this field. Um, and uh, that's one of the things that uh, that they are trying to look at to see, well, what can we do to, to make information, especially older information, available quicker with that in a more automated fashion? Maybe it's secret and below, or maybe it's just confidential information, but there are some things that we ought to try. Thank you for that, John. A few more questions that have come in. Um, could you could political appointees politicize the appeals process or their legal safeguards? Well, um, so that's a tough question to answer here. Um, in my view, the answer is no. Um, the people who make classification decisions, uh, the rules are are set. Uh, in the executive order, um, there is one law that governs classification, and that's the Atomic Energy Act of 1954 as amended, which classifies very specific types of nuclear weapons information and nuclear technology uh, as restricted data or a weird misnomer called formally restricted data. But that information is class classified according to statute. Um, there's also a, a statute that covers the inappropriate or improper disclosure of the names of uh, undercover uh, intelligence sources uh, uh, so that we do have the Intelligence Protections Act, Intelligence Agents Protections Act. So there are some statutes, but otherwise the information is protected uh, and safeguarded according to executive order and then decisions on the length of classification or to appeal that classification goes through an interagency process. Now the interagency process, it does involve kind of senior level officials from those agencies I mentioned, um, uh, Office of Director of National Intelligence, Department of State, Department of Defense, Department of Justice, National Security Council, and the National Archives. Um, and then if the CIA has their information at stake, they are allowed to participate in that discussion as well. But those are professional civil servants who have decades of experience working with the classification system. Um, having worked with them, and I know that Dave worked with them too, these are people that weigh very carefully and they make decisions on whether to continue classification or not based on the merit of whether that information meets the standards or not. Now, who's to say, you know, ultimately the current executive order, the ice caps decisions are discretionary, which means that the agency head, if he doesn't like, or she doesn't like the decision, 
could appeal to the president who could overrule the interagency security classification appeals panel decision. Um, what I'll say is that it, that has never happened. In fact, uh, there have been a few instances where an agency head did not like the ice caps decision to declassify information. But in both of those instances, the president did not weigh in and refused to take that appeal. So it's technically, I suppose, it's possible that a president could weigh in, but it's never happened before. Thanks for that. Um, I want to take the last few questions. Um, this next one um, is a three-parter, and it goes like this. How is declassification handled as a part of the process of compiling the FRUS? That's the first question. The second one, do historians have security clearances? And the third, do they request declassification of records of interest? Three great questions. Um, and that's uh, that's that's kind of where I, I am, have found a home here in the last month here, working for the Office of the Historian at Department of State. So the Department of State historians do go out. Um, they look at records uh, across government that they believe are the most historically important that would enable them to tell the story of U.S. foreign policy and comply with the 1991 statute. Um, after they have compiled what they believe are the most important records, um, we the, the historians do seek declassification of those records by going out to the agencies. The agencies are expected to make those decisions within 120 days um, and get them back so that the uh, the office can then do all of the editorial work and the editing work that goes into publishing those volumes. So there is a process in place for that. Um, and then the third part of your question was, do they kind of find the historically significant? Well, that's one of the things that they do. That's not to say that they're not always the most historical, but they, uh, uh, they certainly try their best as they do their research. Uh, across the executive branch and in the presidential libraries to find the ones that they believe are the most important. Um, there are several different uh, agency historical advisory committees, including at the Department of State, including at the CIA, in other agencies, Department of Energy, uh, Office of the Secretary of Defense, all have historians, they all have security clearances, um, and they're tasked with compiling the history of their departments too. So, uh, so that does happen. So thanks for that. And with that, thank you, John Powers, for your pre presentation and for answering some of these questions. And I turn it back over to Kate. Thank you, Aaron. Um, I really appreciate all of your questions. As you can see here, we have a QR code where you can provide feedback on today's presentation, uh, presentations in the past. You can also um, offer up any ideas for future webinars. You can also see our um, YouTube channel here at the bottom and uh, contact me if you would like to volunteer for the help committee. That's always appreciated. And um, with that, thank you very much for attending. Thanks, John. This was really really, really interesting. And thank you to Godort's Education Committee for co-hosting this with me. Thanks for having me. I appreciate it. Everybody have a great day. Have a good one, everybody. Thank you for doing this.